What do you think when you think of horror? Do you think of Hellraiser? Do you think of Pet Cemetery, Midsommar, Hereditary, all these great movies, Evil Dead, all these different things that we watch on yearly basis that just stick in our minds? Well, for me, when I think of horror, I think Clive Barker. One of the greatest authors I think there is, by far my favorite. I think Clive Barker has such an imaginative mind that you really can't just pin him down to just horror alone. With books like Magica or The Great Secret Show in the Sky, The Inhuman Condition, he really shows his talents across a multitude of different medias, and that includes comic books. And when I found this out, I knew that I had to have it. I had to. And that's what I did. I got them. I got a good majority. Oh, that's the wrong one. But I got it. I got a lot of them. I really did. <laughs> and when I seen there was a Hellraiser comic book, I knew I also had to have those as well. I have about six of these, and I was really, really happy to see that each one is filled with drawings from different artists. Each one is filled with different stories from the Hellraiser universe. And when I cracked open this bad boy, Hellraiser book one, I was amazed. The artwork in this is absolutely fantastic. Some of this comes across as oil painting style. I mean, it is insane. I wonder what these artists are being paid for these things. And on top of that, the stories that are contained inside of this bad boy about the puzzle box, it is just fantastic. It is far better than Tales from the Crypt, Three Horror Stories, all these weird comics from the 70s. They just did such an amazing job. And I would like to share with you the origins of the first time that the Leviathan box was actually found. The first time the Cenobites have been seen. This is before Pins had time even. It is called The Cannons of Pain. And and this is where it begins, on this crude battlefield with all these dead bodies laying around him and one crusader on the quest to find whatever Whatever, whatever crusades are looking for. The Levant, the holiest of holy lands. Since the death of Christ, the site of countless crusades to return his artifacts to the true seat of civilization and learning in the world. In the process, countless lives were lost. Men and women left to die in the dust and sand so that his true word could be better known. And from here, you're actually seeing this man's wife. This is taking place in France. She is sitting there kind of writing these documents. She has actually kind of taken his throne while he is gone. This place is called Castle Carillion. Castle Carillion, the seat of the Count of Carillion, currently on a crusade to return the arrow pierced shroud of Saint Rub Rub. The Count's fiefdom is the third largest in France, and the Lady Carillion has ably managed it since the Count's departure of his holy quest. And one of her servants walks in the room, and she's kind of letting her know that this uh, priesthood would like to come in and ask of her a favor, a question, if you will. And she says, I will, I will allow this. And this, this friar, this priest, whatever he is, he comes in, and what he wants is is the approval for him and his party to be able to celebrate the Feast of St. Jude on the day of the new moon. And she says, Surely, Father, you don't need my approval. The church reigns supreme in our land, and your parish worships for our Lord far exceeds the concern for my word as their landlord. And he says, Not so, my lady. My parish respects the laws of God and of Carillion equally. The Count and you, my lady, have always been fair to them, and your piety is beyond question. Thank you, Father. And by all means, celebrate. I will see to it that you are provided with an ox to properly feed your parish. And he walks out and he says, thank you, my lady. And suddenly she's asking, you know, is there anything else that's troubling you, Leo? And he actually says, yes, you know, I've been having these nightmares of late, these terrible things, and I fear for what your husband will bring back. And she just basically tells me, no, we must pray. We must pray for this man and hope that his voyage goes on accordingly to plan and that he is successful in his endeavors. And it cuts back to this man, all right, in these holy relics. He's entering this cave and he says, Lord, Lord, we thank you in your might that you granted us the strength and the love of our Lord Jesus with which we are able to kill the pagans. This truly must be your greatest treasure, for it came at such a great cost. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He kind of realized, you know, that thousands of people have been slaughtered on this quest and that the thing that is lying in here must be one of the all-time greatest of all time. And he walks in and what he sees in this cave is this small altar with a candle surrounding it in this octagonal shape. And you see the actual Hellraiser puzzle box sitting right here. And he says, why, Lord? This is such a small treasure. He doesn't really understand, you know, how could this possibly help them? It's just a treasury box, you know? It's just a bauble. It doesn't really seem anywhere significant, but he does take it anyway, and he heads it outside, wrapped in his arms. And he tells the rest of the Crusaders, it is over. This crusade was ended. We are returning to France. And that is what he does. And when he returns home, he is very bothered by what he's found. He sees that this box doesn't open. He can't figure out why the Lord would send him on such a quest to slaughter all 
all these people for basically no reason and he just wants answers and answers he shall get. He is sitting at the fireplace and his lovely wife who's been taking care of Castle Carillion, she approaches and she says, will you not come to bed? I have not seen nor touched you in a year and seven months. I have the right. And she's feeling a little frisky. She wants to get a little bit down and dirty with the king and he basically is just not about it. He is so upset about all these lives lost and he says, you cannot imagine the horrors I endured, the losses I sustained, and for what? A box, a mere ornate box, mentioned nowhere in the gospels and holy without value. My husband, if the Lord has brought that box into your hands, then it must have meaning. There must be purpose to it. Come to me now, and I will calm you and your suffering. Come to me. And he says, no, I cannot. I cannot. This bullshit of a box has ruined my life. I, do you know how many women and children I slaughtered over this thing for a gold box? Be gone, woman. He is not having this. He begins to walk away, and she basically tells, Very well. You are everything to me. I will devote myself to the church, to finding in God our place and our passion. I will not fail you, my love. We shall be reunited with faith, or it shall be the death of me. And for the next year or so, she is on to this. Right? She studies the box, and eventually she does figure this out. And it shows her sitting here, toying around with the box as the monk is on her side. And I gotta say, once again, the artwork in this is so fantastic. Deep in the dark reaches, you can actually see some of the Xenobites lurking behind him, just waiting for her to open this. And she finally does. She cracks it open. Lightning surrounds this box. Little pulses of electricity. It opens. It shifts. It moves. And out from the box is one of the Xenobites. One that we've never seen before. And one that I honestly probably can't show you most of it throughout this video. I imagine there's not going to be a ton of panels in this because the artwork in here, while it is great, is full of just grotesque nudity. You have this four-titted beast that comes out of this box. And uh, while it it is funny he is amazing looking all right this is some of the best monster design I've seen but he says I have come and now you must go according to the Cenobite laws every time one is summoned they must take somebody back to their realm with them to endure pain and pleasure and new experiences they say and she looks at him and she says no I know why you are here but on this night Satan you will be denied we are ready for you prince of lies and we will defeat you and he just kind of laughs at them you know he tells them I'm not Satan. I'm something far, far different, something so far detached from that, that none of these little tricks of yours are going to work. Such spirited resistance, in such well-intentioned confusion, but the one who you think I am, I am not. I do not lie. My packs are far more binding. And it shows his hellhound coming out from behind him, and it is about to eat this woman alive. And he says, and my pets are far more ferocious than anything you could find in hell. And she is scared. She calls out for the priest, and she says, quickly, the holy water, begin the the ritual. We will show Lucifer more pain than he thought was possible. And if you know anything about the Cenobites, if anything, this pain is only going to help him, alright? He's gonna love this. It's actually kind of just the thing that they live for this entire time. That is, their entire purpose is actually bring pleasure through pain to extinguish your nerve endings and such. And the king hears all this from a different room and he's screaming, no, such visions, the crucifix, and it shows this cross upside down and he runs to the basement where all this is happening and he says, no, by God, no, it cannot be, dear lord. And he sees the Cenobite ready to take his wife to the next dimension and he says, ah, now all the family is gathered together, and suddenly the king is struck down by these floating swords. Like one goes through his shoulder, one goes through his knee, and they just keep falling and piercing him and piercing him. And obviously this is the man he decides he is going to take. This man kind of loses all faith. He doesn't know why he did all this for such a box that would release Satan onto this world. And what do you know? A sword comes flying through his right eyeball. And it is very, very grotesque artwork through this entire book that uh, this video might even have to be mature rated. This could be our first mature rated video. And suddenly the priest gets down on his knees and he's holding his cross and he says, very well, one is very much like the other and his soul will suffice. And he says, by the power visited in me through the holy word of our Lord, I rebuke you. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are banished. And the Cenobite leaves and this woman and this man start to think, you know, we've just banished this monster. We've done a great job. And really what has happened is they've just made the great transaction, the thing that the Cenobite wanted this entire time. He took his promise. Property. And from here, the wife of the king is now kind of grieving. She's sitting with this priest in this room, and they're just trying to figure out, you know, we need to figure out how to open this box once again, and this time, we will be prepared. The smoke is telling her, we need war against these hellish creatures. While we're so close, we have the power to save the rest of the world. Something strange is going on. People are starting to feel certain feelings, and the priest comes close and wraps his arms around her, and he says, yes, 
Yes, I've always known that you and I would one day come together in God's joy. Now, let it be so. And from here, you're going to get a lot of nude artwork. All this is very biblical artwork. It is very impressive how they actually do this. I would love to see how long this actually took and how much money these people made because I can only imagine how long this one little story must have taken. But suddenly, it shows this lady on this dark table with all these different monks around him. It's in black and white. She's nude. And it starts talking about how all these dark spirits are around them, just waiting for them to come together in darkness. And from here, you get to see a montage of this monk and the lady wife of Carillion uh, doing all these heinous acts. They're drowning babies, they're bloodletting from the people of the streets, they're burning ladies alive, and they're basically just trying to bolster their power for the next time they'll be ready to take this man, this Cenobite, this Satan, back to hell. And what do you know, Lady Carillion is now pregnant with the monk's baby. She says, my baby will be born soon, and I will not bear my child into such a wretched world. We shall see the end of his reign. And they open the box once again, and the same Cenobite pops out. Something that he didn't think would ever happen. He thinks, you know, how could these people be so dumb, so stupid? And he says, so you wish to play again. Which one of you will it be this time? And the priest comes out from back, and he says, neither demon. We have summoned you to lay your reign of unholiness to rest, and Lord shall speak through us and he will strike you down and once again the Cenobite is just kind of enjoying himself you know these people won't let off that he's Satan when he is clearly from a different dimension very obviously although I will say he is very demonic looking if you've seen from any of these images that I've been showing on the screen such passion monsieur could be put to better use Still, your conviction that I am the one you call Satan is most touching. And suddenly, Lady Carillion throws a whole pot of holy water on this beast. He says, Monsieur, you are an amazing paradox. You speak of the Lord's might, and yet you employ only the strength of your guards and the church's influence. Where, pray, does your Lord enter into it? And this monster has just the craziest face I've ever seen. It is far better than Pinhead or any of the Cenobites found in the movies. And I just find this whole tale, this entire book, to be so interesting. I love the idea of just making an entire canon of lore. It's far more better than just getting a movie adaptation like the Evil Dead comic book that we did early on. Basically, like I said, you know, you're just gonna get Evil Dead straight up with a lot, lot more one-liners. But suddenly the priest is looking very scared and he says, I am his instrument. He acts through me. And he's holding up his cross as the Cenobite is just kind of laughing at him. He says, do you think, Monsieur, that if he exists, if he is all as powerful as you claim, that he would trifle himself with you? No, he would not. There is but one of all pervading knowledge man has, one constant known by one and all, suffering, and that is my stock, for which you will now trade. And suddenly he puts up this torture trap, it's this giant X with spikes on it, and the priest is slammed against it, his whole body is punctured with these giant spikes, and he's just bleeding from every corner of his body, and he says, this you will now know, not by your God, not by your Satan, but by me do you know this pain. It is all you have, and it is all you will ever have. This is my gift to you, to know with such clarity, such pristine intuition, and immaculate violation of each particle of your flesh that truly is transcendence. I offer you experience beyond your ken, beyond your mere religion or mundane physical ecstasies. Give up your idle daydreams and live now and forever this lasting truth. Enjoy my gift. But the time has come for us to leave. And do come and join us, won't you, milady? And he looks at the woman, and suddenly she wants mercy, all right? She's backed off into this corner, and she's just like, must you take us all if mercy is in you? And the Cenobite laughs upon her. He's just looking down, mercy. Yes, I believe the day calls for mercy. After all, I could hardly let such remarkable people pass from this place without so much as a trace. One of you shall stay. Who? Who is it to be? And suddenly, everything is gone. Fade to black. And suddenly, Lady Carillion finds herself alone in this room. And from the distance, she hears a baby crying. Her stomach is now gone. And it says, In an imperfect world, its price is often equal parts the good intentions of the righteous and the impurity of the damned. And this baby just keeps screaming and screaming and she's walking down this hallway. The choice between the two determine the path of a soul will walk. And suddenly, she sees this baby laying right next to the puzzle box, laughing crying, 
staring at this very intently. The hair of Carillion will walk a dark path indeed. And what I think this is, is I think the Xenobite may have imbued the power of the different dimension into this child. He may become one of the most evil. He may be marked to be one of the next Xenobites. It could be uh, the Frank situation where he is made into Pinhead. He could just be the next successor of this world of torture, pain, and pleasure. And that is the end of this story. Now, I hope I did a good job at telling this story. Uh, the wording in this is a little bigger than my usual vocabulary. It is very much written like a biblical tale. It is super impressive, honestly. And if you see one of these bad boys, I highly, highly recommend that you pick it up. Each one of these books holds about four or five stories, and every different tale features a different artist with totally different artwork, a different time period, and just an insanely different situation. In this first story that I read last night, I was just so impressed by the art, uh, by the origin of this puzzle box. Or not the origin, it's not the first time this puzzle box. Obviously, it got in that cave somehow. But the first time in any text or movie that we've seen, that this is where it originated at. That this king of Carillion has found this. That he spent his whole time on this crusade slaughtering men, women, and children just to find this thing. Just to basically release this plague upon his entire castle. To have his whole flock slewn before him. Him himself taken down by just these swords and the violence and everything that this book shows. It really just shows how good Clive Barker is. Now, this isn't exactly written by Clive Barker, but I thought, you know, it was so cool of him to allow a bunch of other artists and writers to take a chance, all right? It actually has this writing in the beginning of it that um, him and his friends sat down one night and they devised this whole set of guidelines for the Xenobite universe. And they just called out to every comic writer out there, you know, to take a whack. And they use these guidelines to see what tales they could tell. And there was a lot of these books produced. I own six of them now. I want to get the rest of them, but I'll have to wait a second. I got to chill on these comic books. It's been such a wormhole, but they're all just so interesting, so incredibly awesome. And uh, I hope you guys are able to enjoy these videos with me, to enjoy these stories. I think there's something that everybody should hear. And uh, just so you know, if you can hear a cat in the bathroom, I have a very ornery cat. He wants outside. He's been an indoor cat. I'm trying to acclimate him out to the outdoors, but nonetheless. But yes, everybody, I will give this first story uh, an 8 out of 10. I think it was insanely interesting, a very good way to immerse yourself in the Xenobite universe, to see the beginnings of all this, to see the beginnings of the Xenobites, and to see something before Pinhead's time, you know? I thought that was incredible, and I couldn't be more excited to get all the way through every one of these and just see what awesome stories these writers did, the amazing work they did under Clive Barker's universe, and I'm just learning how much of a world builder this man really is. If I can recommend you any of his actual books, I'd really recommend a Magica or The Secret Show in the Sky. I think they're tales that are truly amazing and they are long, all right? Imagica is about this thick. But yes, everybody, I hope this was enjoyable. I thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you on the next episode, all right? Now, stay away from that puzzle box if you do see it and just have yourself a great little time. Thank you so much for watching once again, everybody.